therefore you have to pay dues. You cannot use the R for realtor in your business cards, in your letterhead, in anything, unless you are a member, and as long as you are a member. <clears throat> so just, just be careful with the word realtor. Not all licensees are realtors. If they don't belong to the association, they're still licensed. They can still collect the commission. They can do everything that you can do. They're just not a member of the association. Okay, so not being a member of the Realtor Association doesn't have any less license than you do. They just might not be a member of the Realtor Association. Yes, ma'am. What is the benefit? Try to find a house without the multiple listing service. See, uh, what would you say? There's about 40,000 in Dade County listings on any given day. Mm -hmm. Try to find them without the multiple listing service. Yeah. I'll also add to that that as long as you belong to a broker, if you are a member in a broker company that the, the broker is a member of the board, you have to be a, a realtor. You have to become a member as well. If the broker is not a, a realtor and they do not work with the MLS, you don't have to. But if the broker does, then you have to. And here's the way they word it. It's real simple. They make the broker responsible. If they hire you or they sign a contract with you for you to work with their company, you have like a maximum of 30 days before the realtor, the board, sends the broker the fee, the bill, because for you. They make the, the broker pay for it. Yeah. If, for the so the broker has two choices. Either pay it or drop you. That's their only choices. They can't just say... Well, give them another month. Well, give them, you know, he's working on the other. No, 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 no. You, you work with a, with a realtor broker, you must become a member. Okay. It is a violation of your contract with your broker, therefore your broker with the association, that everyone that works with them has to be a member. It is not cheap, but it pays for itself. One transaction, one transaction will more than pay for the, for the whole year membership and the MLS. I mean, maybe not a $100 transaction because it's, well, it's about six, $700 a year between the I pay association. Almost, I pay almost $800, but I'm a broker for You're me. It's a little bit more expensive. For the realtor, I believe it's about 600, some 600 or something. So, and they divide it um, in two portions. One of them is about $400, and the other one's uh, 200 uh, a year. within a year. Yeah. Okay, that's not bad. Okay. It's an investment. It's an investment. Uh, yeah. But I said, when I said a couple of thousand dollars, I already included. Right. You know, I already included the realtor association. Now, if you're the broker that you belong to or you, you're going to join is a commercial broker or a guy that works for individual developers and they don't, you don't have a need and they're not a member, you don't have to be. You're still licensed, you can still collect the commission. Uh, the, the MLS is, I don't want to say 100%, but 90% effective for the residential market. Uh, for the commercial market, it's got its limitations because not every commercial broker puts it on the MLS. Uh, so it's got its limitations for commercial and industrial. But for residential, it is an absolute necessary, necessary tool. <clears throat> okay, any questions so far? Did you understand everything we said tonight? Anybody have any doubts? Anybody asleep? No. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. We already. <laughs> we're gonna have the music. <laughs> oh, you got used to the music already. Oh yeah. Good. <clears throat> Look at that. All right, you guys ready to go to chapter two? Let's hit it. Remember, we're not gonna finish chapter two. We're gonna do a portion of chapter two. Yes, ma'am. Um. No, I just wanted to say um. I, I tell them about the questions if they want them to be sent to... Um, there is... Your book, I don't know how many of you even browsed through the book. 
Maybe you didn't browse too much of the book, but you'll find that every chapter has a quiz, and you will not find the answers anywhere on your book, okay? Now, the reason for that is because they want you to get used to taking this kind of test. So you read the chapter, and you take, and you take the test as if it was a test. It doesn't count. You're not graded on it, but... I spoke to Wilma and she has no problem doing this. Uh, if you want, Wilma can send you by email the answers to the individual chapter quizzes and even the practice final exam at the end of the book. Because there is a practice final exam at the end of the book. Practice, quote, not your final, not your real final. Uh, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to suggest to you that if you tell her that you want it, to actually take every chapter quiz, take it, and grade yourself. Because that's what, you gotta remember that you have to, in order for you to say to yourself that you have understood the chapter that you just read, you should be scoring better than 75%. I know that the class test is only 70, but the state test is 75. Mm -hmm. So I would like for you to take after you read each chapter, take the quiz in the back of the chapter and, and quiz yourself or test yourself or grade yourself to see if you're doing better than 75%. You can correct yourself, it doesn't matter. If you just, the big problem here is that sometimes, but you're adults, we're not children, so you're on your own. Um, if you just take and mark the answers on your test, on your quizzes and you don't really take it what's going to happen is when it comes crunch time that means you know three weeks from now that we're getting close to to the final and you're getting nervous uh, you're going to start studying questions and answers and there's a large problem with that number one we're only allowed five percent of the questions that you got on the on this book to be repeated on your final. Okay. Wilma and I did not design your test. It was designed by the editor of the book, the author of the book. And they're only, in order for their test to be approved, only 5% repeat. So if you study by questions and answers, you're only gonna get 5% for that. So that's why my suggestion is, if you want it, by all means, she'll send it to you, but be very careful studying questions and answers. And the state test, you'll be lucky if you get one question the same as your book. Remember what I said at the very beginning. The state has anywhere from three to 5,000 questions in their bank. It's called a bank of questions. It's computerized. So the computer system is going to select the 100 questions for you that day. He may not get the same hundred questions than you, and you're not going to get the same hundred questions. And they got five thousand to choose from. So studying questions and answers is not going to help you to pass the state exam. So what I'm trying to do is help you by telling you get used to the type of question, the language in the questions, so that you can take the question apart and learn the process. Then. If you know the topic, no matter what questions is thrown at you, you, you should be able to answer. And it's multiple choice, so remember that you can always, if you've studied the material, you can, you can get rid of two of them. The other two might be close and it, it takes some reading to get to know them, but you can make it a 50-50 proposition rather than only a 25%. 99% of the questions will be four answers, A, B, C, D. Before we take the test, I'll give you some more hints as to how to deal with multiple choice questions, but for the most part, you should be able to eliminate two of the four, where you're now in a 50-50 proposition, knowing what you read. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, be that way. Where are you? There you are. Give me number two. 
Thank you. There we go. Now, chapter two, and by the way, I don't know if you have, if you've ever had a conversation with Linda Coffield or the state. I've been fighting the state for 10 years now. I don't like chapter number two being number two. I want chapter number two to be number one. Only because this is the, this is the license law qualifications. This is what you need to, to do and, and to know for the application and to be able to quali be qualified to take the state exam. They do it in chapter two, instead of telling you all about real estate. Tell me what I need to know. Okay. <laughs> chapter two deals with um, license law. Remember that you have a chapter review on every one of them. And this one says, after completing this chapter, the student should be able to define the sales associate, broker associate, and broker. Those are the three basic license terms. List the academic requirements for sales associate and broker licenses. List the application requirements for sales associate and broker licenses. Identify services of real estate requiring a licensure. Recognize exemption from licensure. And distinguish between post-licensing education and continuing education. I told you a little bit about it. Now you're going to get into the nitty gritty. <clears throat> One of the first things that you've got to know is a Latin term called caveat emptor. Caveat emptor is, is buyer beware. Okay? Um, let the buyer beware. The intent of real estate regulation is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Not for your protection, for the protection of the public. Today, law has evolved to protect the buyer with disclosure, disclosures of material defects. We're going to talk about all the disclosures required. The key terms, uh, things that you haven't probably never heard of, something like nolo contendere. Anybody know what that is, nolo contendere? I guess you've never had a ticket, in, a traffic ticket in your life either. That's good for you. No contest. No contest. Nolo contendere. How about prima facie evidence? Another one of the terms that you've probably never heard of. Prima facie is what you see in front of you, take it as, take it as legal. One of, the, one of the best examples I can give you of prima facie evidence is somebody shows you a license in real estate. You don't have to go run to your computer to check it. Take it in face value, prima facie, okay? Somebody shows you a license, they're licensed. You're not required to be investigators. You take it for what it's worth. If they made a, a bad copy or they made a good copy or they made a, a false one, it's their problem, not yours. Take it on face value. <clears throat> How about withhold adjudication? Any ever, anybody ever heard that term, withhold adjudication? Well, when you go to court, if you ever, and I hope you'll never go to court on a traffic ticket, and the judge says, we're going to withhold adjudication, but you still got to pay $200 for, for court costs. What the judge just said to you is that we're going to not find you guilty for now. We're going to trust what you said, okay? But you still have to pay court costs because you took our time. Withhold adjudication. Based on your evidence, they're going to trust what you said and neither call you guilty or not guilty. They're just going to leave it, leave it as such, but you still have to. Now, here's what happened with is nolo contendere. Nolo contendere in many terms and especially in real estate licensees is you plead at no contest. When it comes to license law, they look at that as being guilty. If you ever plead nolo contendere to anything, and you have to take the, you got to take, the, tell the real estate board, they're going to count that as being guilty. They don't like no contest. Fight for your rights. Nolo contendere is not good. Okay. Let's take a, after caveat emptor, we're going to look at, we're going to look at the, <clears throat> The statutes that are important and 
sometime between